know what I mean? I just, I went to that church and uh, I did it. You did what? <laughs> well, you, I mean, uh, I realized that these people, you know, they're, they're at church, you know, they're not criminals or anything. That's not because the criminal black people kill innocent. Well, I had to do it because somebody had to do something. Saving it? I am guilty. <laughs> Dylan Roof was born in Columbia, South Carolina, to a carpenter father and a bartender mother. His family moved often, but always remained in South Carolina eventually settling in the small town of Eastover, where the majority of the population was African American. As he grew up, Roof showed signs of obsessive compulsive disorder, worrying about germs and insisting on a particular haircut. As he changed schools so often, he had difficulty making friends, and it was hard for him to fit in. This further contributed to his anxiety and depression, and by high school, Roof was abusing illicit drugs and alcohol, as a form of self-medication. In nine years, Roof attended at least seven schools in two South Carolina counties. While living in Columbia, Roof maintained ties to Lexington. He still had family in the area, where he attended Midland High School. And due to his mixed academic record, he was forced to repeat the ninth grade, which likely contributed to his dropping out of school. In fact, his struggles with school and his father's expectations had pushed him to the brink, leading him to give up on both education and his job. Even though his father told him not to, he chose to use drugs and got into trouble. He would stay in his room for days, lost in thought, feeling as if he were a failure, wondering how people would notice him. Around that time, he also realized that he didn't love the country. In fact, his blood is mostly from the British Isles, but he has been blessed with a significant amount of German blood, and a German surname. Moreover, as he continued to search for information about his family, he kept seeing the name, Trayvon Martin. He read an article, and right away he was unable to understand what the big deal was. It was obvious that Zimmerman was on the right. But more importantly, this prompted him to type in the words, black on white crime, and he has never been the same since that day. The first website he came to was the Council of Conservative Citizens. There were pages upon pages of these brutal black on white murders. At this moment, he realized that something was very wrong. How could the media be focusing on Trayvon Martin, while ignoring hundreds of black on white murders? It took him seven months, all of those drives, all of that planning. The first time he visited Mother Emmanuel, it was not to plan the killings, but to scout out the church, and become familiar with the environment, this is what made the attack more successful and deadly. Two months later, he ordered the South African and Rhodesian flag patches, and made a phone call from his mother's house to the church. He was then questioned about the February 28th incident at Columbiana Center, in which he entered the mall wearing all black clothing, and asked employees unsettling questions. During the questioning, authorities found a bottle of what was later admitted to being Suboxone, a narcotic used either for treating opiate addictions, or as a recreational drug. He was then arrested for a misdemeanor charge of drug possession. In the end, he got a one-year ban from Columbiana Center. But the ban was extended for three years, after he was arrested again for trespassing on the mall grounds. He was also arrested again for misdemeanor trespassing, in Lexington County. His first arrest was listed as a felony, which would have required an inquiry into the charge during a background investigation. However, it was legally a misdemeanor charge, and was incorrectly written as a felony, due to a day-to-entry error, made by a jail officer. Days later, he was investigated for loitering in his parked car. He had been recognized by an off-duty police officer, who investigated his March 2nd questioning. A police officer searched his vehicle, and found a forearm grip, 
for an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle, and six unloaded magazines, all capable of holding 40 rounds. When asked about it, Roof replied that he wanted to purchase an AR-15, but did not have enough money to do so. He was not charged, as it was not illegal in South Carolina to possess a firearm. But on his birthday, his father gave him the money he wanted so he could purchase the gun he had always wanted. And eight days after Dylan Roof turned 21, the legal age for purchasing a gun in South Carolina, he took the money his father had given him for his birthday, and drove to a gun store in West Columbia, where he picked out his gun. But Dylan Roof had been arrested for drugs a year ago, and he couldn't carry a gun. Nevertheless, he lied on his concealed weapon application, and answered no to the question, are you unlawfully using or addicted to marijuana, or any other depressant, or controlled substance? As former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer once said, yes, people pull the trigger, but guns are the instrument of death. Gun control is necessary, and delay, means more death, and horror. On the morning of the church massacre, Roof posted a manuscript, and images expressing his racist beliefs, on his website. In the manuscript, he used racial slurs, expressed his belief that white people are superior, and decried integration. That same evening, he left his mother's house, in Lexington, and drove two hours to Charleston, to the historic mother Emmanuel. Dylan came to Charleston with 88 hollow point bullets, that were made to expand when they hit body tissue, and do a lot of damage as they went through their target. Roof pulled into the church parking lot, and sat in his car for some time, contemplating, before walking into the church. He had loaded eight clips of hollow point ammunition, because he wanted to fire 88 bullets. He walked into the basement entrance, where Emmanuel's pastor, Clemente Pinckney, who also served in the South Carolina State Senate, when he was 23, as the youngest ever elected to the state's legislature. Pinckney welcomed him, gave him a Bible, and offered him a chair next to him in the circle, where the 12 attendees of the study group sat. He was there for 45 minutes to an hour. When they stood up and shut their eyes to say a prayer, aside from the call to arms, he hoped his attack would agitate others, worsen race relations, increase racial tensions, and provoke a civil war. When they first heard the noise, they thought it was a newly installed elevator, but by then, Roof had already killed Pinckney. He then aimed at the oldest woman in the room, Susie Jackson, who was three years away from turning 90. She was shot 11 times. Jackson's nephew, 26-year-old, Taiwanza Sanders, tried to talk him down and asked, why he was attacking churchgoers. His plea fell on deaf ears, so he stood up, and faced Roof's barrel, so that his mother, Felicia Sanders, his aunt Susie, and his niece, might live. He also shot and killed, Sharanda Coleman Singleton, and a Payne Middleton doctor. Two respected women with young children, church leaders, and teachers. Sharanda had three children, and the Payne had four daughters, who were supposed to attend the prayer meeting, but at the last minute, they stayed home. Myra Thompson, had received her preaching certificate that afternoon, and after weeks of study, she would lead the group for the first time. Cynthia Hurd, was a faithful and devoted librarian, so when Sanders asked her to stay for the prayer meeting, she did so in a humble way. Roof pulled the trigger seven times, before he murdered, Ethel Lance. Ethel was a symbol of hope in the community and a source of strength for her family. She dedicated her life to being a source of support and love for her community, and her death was a tragic loss, especially to her deaf son, and daughters. Daniel Simmons, a pastor who also served at Greater Zion Church, in Auendor, died at the medical center. At one point, he paused to ask Polly Shepard, a 72-year-old retired nurse, if he had shot her yet. She's the other lady. I could have, but I didn't. Do you remember telling that lady, I'm going to let you live so you can tell my story? Or yeah, like that? I don't I told remember her. saying that, but you know, there's really... Please hold.
911, what's the address of the emergency? Please, Emmanuel Church is playing people shot down here. Please send somebody right away. Emmanuel Church? Emmanuel Amy, 110 Calhoun. And there's people shot? Yeah, he shot the pastor. He shot all the men in the church. Please come right away. Okay, my partner's going to be getting some help on the way while I get a little bit more information from you, okay? Stay on the line with me. Are he's you safe? In, or he's, he's still in here, I'm afraid. He's still in here. Where are you? I'm in Emmanuel Amy Church on one Yes, ma'am, but where are you inside the church? In the lower level. You're in the lower level? Where is the shooter? He's in the, in the office. Yes, ma'am. I've got officers en route to you. Don't hang up with me. I want you to stay on the line with me. You stay as quiet as possible. Do you hear me? Yes, I'm under the table. What is, what is your name, ma'am? Polly Shepard. All right, Miss Polly. Like I said, my partner's getting some help on the way while I get this information from you, okay? You stay on the line with me. He's and, coming. He's coming. He's coming. Please. Okay, ma'am. Are you able to... I, if he's coming, I need you to be as quiet as possible. Is there something that you can hide under? I'm under the table. Did you see him at all? Yes, he's a young 21-year-old white dude. Okay. Please, honey, we got some people very hurt, please. Yes, ma'am. And you said that, were you able to see the gun? Do you know what kind of gun it was? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where they were guns. Okay, that's okay. He was still in the room when Polly reached for her phone and called the police. Okay, that's okay. And where are the weapons now? He's got it in his hand. He's reloading. He's reloading? <laughs> okay, I need you to bear with me, okay? How many shots has he fired? I don't know. There's so many. Three different rounds are all kind of... Oh, God, please. Okay. Please, please, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, please. Help us, Lord, please. Jesus, help us. Do you know what his name is? No, no. Okay, do you know what color shirt he had on? Green. Do you know what color pants he had on? Timberland boots? Jeans. But do you don't know what his name no, no, no. Okay. Okay, who is that? That's another lady talking to you alive. But there's so many people dead, I think. Oh, my God. You said there's so many people dead? I think they're dead, yes. That last is on the way. Okay, and I just want to make sure you're at the Emmanuel Ami Church, 110 Calhoun Street. Yeah, I mean, 110 Calhoun. Oh, God, please. Okay, you, you're doing a great job, Miss Polly, and I've got help coming to you, okay? I just need you to stay on the line with me. Is there a vehicle that he might leave in that you know? I don't have an idea. Okay. What door did he come in? He came in the back door. at the office door. Back side of the church. How many people are in the building? I, I don't have an idea. This is about 10 of us. Okay. Are you all in the same area? Are there people upstairs? No, we're in the same area. You're all downstairs? Yes, yeah, please, please, please. Okay. Is there, yes, ma'am, Miss Polly, I've got help coming to you as fast as they can. Is there a door that leads downstairs? Oh, yes, two doors. They're open. They're both open. Are you able, are you able to shut and lock those doors? Safely? I, I can't move. No one is here. Okay. If you don't feel like you can move, then I don't want you to move, okay? Okay. Miss Polly, are you or anyone else in immediate danger? It's still in here, man. Okay. Are you able to get yourself to safety? Can you talk to me freely? No, I can't because he's really in the building. He's still in the building. 
Okay, what's the best way to get to you, Miss Polly? Uh, what? Oh, can I come down to Yes, ma'am, but inside the building, what's the best way to get to you? Just come in the back door. And I'll just go and hear somebody coming. You can hear somebody coming? Okay, I want you to be quiet. What, what's going on, Miss Polly? He reportedly said, while reloading his firearm five times, you'll want something to pray about? I'll give you something to pray about. Felicia Sanders, a longtime member of Emmanuel, escaped harm that night, only to witness the death of her hero son, Tywanza. Sanders began to sob as she recalled her difficult pregnancy with him. And now she watched her son come into this world, and also watched her son leave this world. Amid a fierce storm, Sanders was lying on the floor, shielding her 11-year-old granddaughter, holding her so tightly, that she was afraid she might smother the little girl. Police started looking for Roof, sending out photos and setting up a phone bank. Acting on a tip the next morning, officers in Shelby, North Carolina, stopped Roof's car. You know what, tomorrow night Cowboy Mouth is going to be playing at Friday at the Flower. I'm so excited about that. I'm going to head over to Science on the Rocks first and check out their uh, big guitar instrument. Now is the time to buy it in Kenny Chevrolet Buick. No one's going to make you a better deal. You can get a brand new 2015 Buick Enclave and save up to $6,000. Shelby, Flesh Department. Hey, this is uh, Todd Brady from down at Brady's Floors in Kings Mountain. Uh, I've been talking to Shane over at the Kings Mountain Police Department, and one of my drivers is up there in Shelby, and she said that right. she is behind the car. I don't know if he's already called and in and all about that. Hey, 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 call me. Do you know where they're possibly at now? They just passed Carter Chevrolet going towards, you know. Uh, let, me, let me tell my officers right quick. Okay. I've got some officers out further. We had some back near the mall. Okay. She said he's at Charles Road. You're headed towards Ingalls. Okay. Okay. I've got some officers out there where Ingalls is right now. Okay. She said it may not be, but I've got the tag number. It's LGF. Um, okay. 330 South Carolina tag, black Honda. And it has a you know, weird circle tag on the front, she said. And the boy has a bold looking haircut. Yeah. The day after the shootings, the state of South Carolina charged him with nine counts of murder, three counts of attempted murder, and one count of possessing a firearm. Um, well, can you tell us about what happened last night? Well, yeah, I mean... I just, I went to that church in Charleston, and uh, I did it. Who did what? <laughs> well, you, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, I did, I killed him. Well, I guess, I mean, I don't really know. Well, what, 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 so, did you shoot him? Yes. What kind of gun did you use? <laughs> a Glock 45. Okay. Was that, was that your gun? or? Yes, I bought it from the gun store. Do you know how many people you shot? If I was going to guess, Maybe, I'm really not sure exactly. Just search it. Well, four, five, four, I'm not sure. Did, did you say anything to them before or after or during? No, I didn't say anything to them before or anything. Before and what about What about after? They reacted after I shot. Yeah, right, we understand. Yeah, yeah. All right. I guess my, my question, and it might have been a bad question, I was just trying to figure out, you know, some of the, I suddenly, I don't know, if I pulled a gun out 
and everybody saw it, people might start to run or whatever. Oh, no, 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 it was very fast. It was not like, I was like, you know, it was like quick motion. So can you show what, what, were you sitting down and you did it, or did you stand up or what? Yeah, I was sitting down the first, the first can, can you show me like what you did? I mean, yeah, it was just like, you know. Did you like this or just, yeah, like, you know. And just started shooting it? Yeah. At people? And we'll go back and I'll ask you some more questions. About See, this I had it in a bag. It was in a bag. When the bag's there. I dropped it. Yeah, you dropped it a bag. It was a black bag. Look, like, oh. it was like a thing you can buy a sporting goods thing, you know, for military people to hook on their whatever, their vests or whatever. But I just put it in my belt, and I had all my magazines and the gun in there. When I walked in the church, this thing was right on me, in front of me. You know. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh my God, they're gonna see it, you know? And obviously they did, because I mean, this thing is big, it's heavy, uh -huh. you know, because it's got, what, seven magazines, with, and I put 11 bullets in each magazine. They can hold 13, but I didn't want any jam, like it to jam or anything like that. So, you know, but anyway, it's still really heavy. Anyway, they saw it, but I just sat down, because I guess they just didn't say anything. You know, and then I was sitting there and I was like, you know, just thinking about whether I should do it or not. You know, and just, that's why I was sitting there for 15 minutes, just like, oh, uh, you know, like, because I know I could have just walked out, you know, because they didn't say anything to me about the, what, you know, the thing on my belt. So I could have walked out, you know, and that's why I was just thinking, you know. But then I just, you know, like, I just, uh, uh, like, I don't know, it's like, not I, if you want to say spur of the moment, but you know, I just, I just finally decided I had to do it. And that's pretty much it. Well, well, that that's that goes to the next question. Why did you have to do it? Oh, I had to do it. How come? I mean, that's what I, that's what I don't know. I mean, oh. Dylan, did when <coughs> you said you had to do this because so basically what you're. I have to do it because nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is brave enough to do anything about it, you know. Back in the late 80s and the early 90s, you know, we had skinheads and stuff like that. There's no skinheads left. There's no KKK. KKK never did anything anyway. Yeah. So basically you were trying to make a, uh, you were trying to make a statement or prove a point on behalf of the white race, is that what you're saying? Yeah, in a way, I guess. Did somebody help? Did did, did you talk to people or anybody in particular about this prior to making this decision oh, to do this? No, this no. So you came you came about this decision solely solely by yourself, right? And did you? Um, did, what's the reason why you? Because you said you uh, you'd never been in that church before, right? But you said as you were driving by once, and correct me if I'm wrong, you saw somebody getting into the car. So you asked oh yeah, them, I was walking. Okay, was, you were walking, mm -hmm. and you saw somebody getting into a car. So you asked them, you asked about a Bible study. Is that correct? No, I just asked them. I said. When's the church service, you know, and then she told me the church service and the Bible study or something like that, and the Times or something. I guess. Was, that, was that an African-American woman or a white yes, woman? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, this is an African Methodist Episcopal. Is that what AME stands for? I think I think that's what it stands for. I'm not so sure. that, that's why you went to that Is that why you chose that church? Oh, yes. Because you were looking for African-Americans. Right. Right. I wasn't going to go to another church, you know, because there could have been white people there. So you 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 didn't want to kill any white people, or shoot any. Oh no! You just wanted to shoot, to, 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 no. to black people. All right. Yeah. What was the reason why? Because um, so if you're, you're from you 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 lived with your dad's for a while and you stayed at your mom's right. for a while. What was the reason why you chose Charleston as your location? Why why oh. that particular area there? Well, the reason it's a historic city, you know. You know, at one time, I think it had the highest ratio of black people to white people in the whole country, you know, when, when we had slavery, but, you know, and then the other reason is just because that AME church was historic, too, you know, it was a historic AME church. I mean, I guess that's pretty much the reason. Well, how did you find out about that AME church in Charleston? Did you research it? Yeah, I just looked up black so, so you had you had the bag on you. It's about when you finally thought, no, I've got to do this. I've got, I've got to, you know, you came here to do it, and you told yourself you had a thought. You, you had a thought about leaving, right? Yes, I did. But then you said, no, I, I'm here. I got to do it. Right. And so you, you pulled your gun out of the bag. How many magazines did you have in your bag? 
Eight. Yeah, eight. But that when one was in the gun. Yeah, so seven in the back. Seven in the back. Okay. Yeah. So, for the, how many times did you reload? All the times. So you went through all eight magazines? Yes. No, 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 no. Actually, no. I went through seven magazines and I took one magazine with me. Which is still in the gun. And where's the gun at now? Well, it wasn't my car when they arrested. When they arrested, so the gun. And I told them about it. And it's got a loaded, the one loaded mag. So you shot through. You had essentially, I said you put like ten or eleven bullets in each magazine. So, right. So, so, so the gun wouldn't malfunction with misfeed or whatever, right? Right. right. And so you you went you reloaded, you shot and reloaded seven times. Or am I right? One of the magazines. So, so. Well, reloaded. Yeah, because the last one you took with you. You shot. Right. One that was in there. Shot it. Went through six more magazines shooting and right. then reload. Really did you, so but by that time, I mean, people that were already down, did you walk up and shoot them that had already, you know, um, went to the fellow well, See, it was sort of complicated because they were all like under the tables. You see what I'm saying? It's not like I uh, was like, uh, you know, going around shooting people that were already dead or anything like that. It's just when I shot a magazine, it's like I just went, pop, 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 pop. you see what I'm saying? like at one person you see what I'm saying so, so. while none of us none of us has the heart for vengeance we all have the resolve to seek and to find justice in this case it's easy to imagine that the idea of what justice looks like in this case varies some victims some family members of victims because of their faith do not believe in the vet death penalty under any circumstances. Some believe the death penalty is, is just too easy. It's not a religious consideration or a philosophical consideration, it's a practical consideration. Still others believe that the death penalty for the mu murders at Mother Emanuel Church is uh, entirely appropriate. All understand my responsibility and have shown great respect, even deference, for my decision to seek the death penalty for the killings at Mother Emanuel Church. For that, I am truly, truly grateful. This was the ultimate crime, and justice from our state calls for the ultimate punishment. He offered to plead guilty in exchange for a sentence of life without parole, but the federal government declined. The court then entered a not guilty plea on his behalf, and set a trial date. During the first two stages of his trial, Dylan Roof decided to represent himself. As family members of the victims testified, they watched him dismiss them from the stand with his blunt, deep voice. His detached demeanor created an uneasy atmosphere as the proceedings unfolded, and his cold refusal to acknowledge the pain of the family members, only added to this unsettling feeling. Even when his mother fainted in the courtroom, Dylan did not appear to look back at her. After a seven-day trial, it took a federal jury less than two hours to reach a verdict. During the trial, Roof, the white supremacist, chose to stay quiet, and still in the face of so much devastating testimony, and evidence that his mother, who was sitting in the third row, had a heart attack on the first day. Before trial, defense counsel gave notice of their intent to call an expert on Roof's mental health, at the penalty phase. The news upset him. Soon after, he sent a letter to the prosecution, accusing his attorneys of misconduct. In his opinion, his lawyers were extremely moralistic about the death penalty, and they were forced to clutch at straws since he had no defense. After the guilt phase of the trial, Roof advised the court that he wished to represent himself during the penalty phase. That backed up the position he took after the jury was chosen, when he switched from representing himself to being represented by a lawyer, but argued for the right to represent himself again, during the punishment phase of the trial. Before the penalty phase started, Roof's standby lawyer questioned his ability to stand trial or represent himself, during the penalty phase. At the end of the competency hearing, the court directly questioned Roof. He again denied believing that he would be saved by white nationalists, if he received the death penalty. 
he acknowledged the high risk that he would be sentenced to death, and ultimately executed, if he presented no mitigation evidence. Roof confirmed once more that, to prevent his lawyers from undermining his message, with mental health evidence, he wanted to represent himself. Instead, he chose to ignore evidence about mental health, because it didn't fit with his political and social views. Mr. Bannon, how does your client wish to plead? I believe you previously said he wished to plead guilty, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, from your investigation, facts, and circumstances of the case, do you feel that the state can <coughs> produce sufficient evidence to convince the jury of his guilt? Yes, sir, I do. And you feel that's in his best interest to enter the guilty plea? Yes, sir, I do. All right, Mr. Roof, you're pleading guilty to nine counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder, is that correct? Yes. Mr. Roof, do you understand that the possible maximum sentence for the murder under the negotiated plea would be life without parole, do you understand? Yes. And you have nine murder charges, that would be nine life without parole, do you understand? Yes. Have any question of that? No. On the three attempted murders, you could receive up to 30 years on each one, do you understand? Yes. Have any question about that? No. Do you understand the possible maximum sentence you could receive on all of them? Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand that you will not be eligible for parole on the life sentences? Yes. It, it means what it says, life without parole. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand fully the nature of the charges against you and the, and the uh, range of possible sentences? Yes. Do you understand when you enter a guilty plea, you give up certain constitutional rights. Do you understand? Yes. You give up a right to a jury trial. You understand? Yes. At a jury trial, the state would be required, excuse me, would be required to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you understand? Yes. You could offer witnesses on your behalf as to a defense. Do you understand? Yes. Your attorney could cross-examine witnesses, present evidence on your behalf, and the jury would unanimously have to find you guilty. Do you understand? Yes. You could offer testimony on your behalf, or the, the uh, attorney could offer other witnesses on your behalf, or you may testify on your own behalf if you so chose. Do you understand? Yes. Knowing that about a jury trial, do you want a jury trial? No. Do you understand that you have the right to remain silent in the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution? Yes. No one can make you testify against yourself. Do you understand? Yes. When you enter a guilty plea, you will be acknowledging your guilt. Do you understand? Yes. When you acknowledge your guilt, you will be testified against yourself. Do you understand? Yes. Are you willing to give up your Fifth Amendment rights today to enter your guilty plea? Yes. All right, Mr. Roof. Are you willing to give up the constitutional rights that I previously explained to you? Yes, sir. How do you wish to plead? Guilty. And are you guilty of the nine murder charges, the uh, three attempted murder charges, and the pistol charge? Yes, sir. All right, what I'm going to do at this time, Mr. Roof, and I want you to listen. I'm going to ask the solicitor to give me the facts in the cases, okay? And after she gives me the facts, I'm going to ask you if you agree with those facts. If you disagree, I want to know specifically what you disagree with. Can you do that? Yes. Dylan Roof became the first person in the U.S. sentenced to death for a federal hate crime. President Joe Biden, as a candidate, said he'd work to end federal executions. Biden has connections to the case. He attended the funeral for Clemente Pinckney, who also pastored the congregation. During his 2020 presidential campaign, Biden frequently referenced the shooting, saying that a visit to Mother Emanuel helped him heal in the aftermath of the death of his son, Bo. So if I, if I told you nine people died last night, how would that make you feel? And I wouldn't believe you. Well, I would believe that there was nine. There wasn't even nine people there. It was just a little bit over nine. But it's hard when you're looking at the tables to judge people. Because okay. you said when you went in there, you said it could have been six, eight, really weren't certain. You know. Are you guys lying to me? Yeah. No, we're not. Eight, eight people were dead at the scene. Two were rushed to the hospital. So I guess it was ten people were shot. I actually had... Gunshot injuries. It's my understanding. The, the, uh, the ninth person died at the hospital, but eight people were, were dead on the scene. Who showed up? Um, 
I mean, so I mean, so. How do you feel? In all honesty. Well, it makes me feel bad. But also? Black on white crime, and no one's paying attention to that. The lack of movement with the skinhead movement, the KKK. So you said you wanted to kill black people. Now that you did, what are your thoughts? What I guess what message do you want to be told to the public? What do you what do you want people to remember Dylan Roof for? Uh, 